Hello, my name is Michael Hicks. Welcome to the round table this month. Our host is Heather Williams, and she runs Ball State University's Office of Building Better Neighborhoods. Welcome, Heather. Thank you. I want to invite you here this week. I think our viewers would like to hear a little bit more about what, uh, at least the buzz around here, is a very innovative program designed to connect the university with neighborhoods and, and help neighborhoods advance. So could, could you just tell us a little bit about the program? Sure. Uh, Building Better Neighborhoods began in 2014, originally grant funded by the Ball Brothers Foundation. And there were a number of leaders in Muncie that came together, including the Ball Brothers Foundation, the city of Muncie, Ball State University, knowing that there needed to be a stronger connection between Ball State and Muncie's neighborhoods. So funding was allocated and I was hired in 2014. And really it was an exciting time to be in this position because no one really knew what this would look like. You know, it was organic. And I was able to build the program um, how I saw you know, it, would be, it would fit the needs of the neighborhoods. So my main goal is to match the needs of the neighborhoods with the resources of Ball State University and uh, Muncie's robust nonprofit, nonprofit sector. So um, my work is, um, it's really out in the neighborhoods. I'm one of the only offices at Ball State that is located off campus. So my office is in the Rose Court Building, downtown Muncie, and I'm able to you know, really be out connecting with individuals, um, which is really exciting work. So what attracted you to the job? Um, well, my background is, um, is varied. So I have um, a bachelor's degree in history, a master's in um, business and urban planning. And really that was, a, I feel like, a perfect mix of um, education um, because I'm taking um, neighborhoods in, in working with residents to develop neighborhood associations. So you really have to be cognizant of the history of a neighborhood. You have to start with that, that knowledge. And um, you know, entrepreneurship is all about creative thinking and um, being willing to change. And you take that um, with the fundamental knowledge that um, planning provides. So you have um, um, those three things, you know, really provided a framework for me to go into the neighborhoods and impact, you know, in, in, be impactful in my work. And I also have to say that um, I worked for the city of Muncie for five years and uh, was able to really understand how a city um, can impact neighborhoods how the work of a city can impact neighborhoods. And you know, a lot of the questions that I got in the first um, year or so um, from neighborhood associations were very basic. You know, who do I call if, um, you know, if we have potholes? Who do we call if um, you know, there are signs out on our streets? Um, so I was able to develop relationships with neighborhood leaders because I could answer those questions. You know, I worked in the city, I knew who to call. Um, so from those basic issues, you know, we've really worked up the scale um, of need. So if you're looking at um, things like potholes, um, sidewalks upheaving um, as being basic needs, you know, then working up to address higher level needs, um, you really have to start with a foundation where you've developed relationships. And I was able to do that because of my background in working in the city. That's a great way to describe. I think what, it, at least on, from my perspective, looks to be a very innovative way to do this. Sort of like a, a Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But Absolutely. Um, how many communities or how many neighborhoods do you work with over the course of a year? Um, you know, it, it really varies. Um, every neighborhood is different. Every single neighborhood has a different history, has a different culture, a different character. Um, and, you know, it depends on the leadership in a neighborhood and you know leaders come and go so you may have a strong leader in a neighborhood at one at one point in time in a year and then a year later you know that's that's gone that individual you know they're not able to continue to volunteer their time to do neighborhood association work so then i'm asked to come in and perhaps um, help rebuild the association or i could be asked um, to come in because it's a strong association, but you have um, conflicts, you know, relationship conflicts. So, um, you know, I've experienced that in the past. Um, all across the board, you know, I, I can work with um, 10, 15, uh, you know, 20 neighborhoods. Um, I also um, run a um, program called the Neighborhood Leadership Council, and this organization meets monthly 
bringing together leaders from all across the city. And they may not be presidents or you know established leadership with um, defined roles. They may just be individuals who um, self-identify as leaders in their neighborhood and they, they want to do good work. So they come to the Leadership Council to learn from others in Muncie. And we also bring in speakers. So in that instance, you know, I'm working with leaders all across the city. And um, you know, I, I, hear, I hear what their needs are. And that allows me to go back to the university and, and look for ways to fulfill those needs. I, you know, I have the opportunity to work with, um, with my colleagues at the Office of Community Engagement, and they um, you know, have provided support for, you know, for some of this work. You know, we have a really robust website, MuncieNeighborhoods.org, where we catalog all of the resources that we've, we've gathered for neighborhood associations in Muncie. So that might be um, the city housing code, you know, the, the basic housing code. That might be um, ways to um, access your uh, local politicians. It may be workbooks that speakers have, um, have created for our neighborhoods, like how to create a Facebook page. Um, you know, all of that information is cataloged there on that website. So um, my reach is not just who I work with individually in the neighborhoods. It's, it's really, it's more than that. You know, we have these resources online. We hold these meetings monthly. And I'm always available for, um, for anyone who has a question in, you know, how do, I, how do I grow my neighborhood? How do I improve my neighborhood? Oh, that's great. What, um I'm thinking about as you talk about this process that you're developing, is there like a formal process that you've developed to talk or is it idiosyncratic to where that neighborhood might be at one period in time? It's absolutely dependent on the neighborhood. I can't come in top down and say, this is what you need right. um, because I don't live there. You know, they do. They know what their issues are. They know what their needs are. Um, I was able to work with my colleagues in the Office of Community Engagement to develop a really robust um, neighborhood organizing workbook that's um, really targeted to developing a neighborhood association in Muncie. So it has very specific information, um, but it also has very broad information. You know, there, um, there's kind of a scale of organization that we try to keep track of um, through my work. And it looks at certain basic things, like do you have elected um, leaders? Do you hold monthly meetings? Um, are you, um, do you have bylaws? Do you have articles of incorporation? Are you incorporated at the state? Do you have an EIN number, a bank account? So we do keep track of these things um, and they do change. You know, over time, you know, leadership changes, um, interest in a neighborhood association may decline and some of those things may fall off. You may not be keeping up your, um, your, your information at the state, so you lose your, um, your nonprofit status. And then you know we may help provide information on how to get that back. So um, you know it, it really depends. So just uh, I think four or five episodes back, I hosted Emily Warnell, sociologist that works at the Rural Policy Research Institute here at Ball State. And one of the things she talked about in talking about communities was that really successful communities or successful neighborhoods mm -hmm. tended to have strong social networks. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what, what you think are the strengths in communities or neighborhoods that you think are successful in going through the process mm -hmm. and achieving some of their goals. Probably the, n the number one uh, most important thing for a neighborhood is to have strong leadership. And that may not be um, you know, someone who is formally trained as a leader or even self-identifies as a leader, but just someone that steps up and, and says, you know, I'm going to make sure that this work happens. Um, and that, you know, that, that happens here in the city of Muncie. We have associations that are, that are very successful in um, uh, getting the word out about events or um, you know connecting with the mayor um, if there are issues in the neighborhood but they're not the president they're not the vice president they're just an individual who has stepped up and said that I'm, I'm going to take charge of this so for instance uh, the Whiteley neighborhood has um, very very strong leadership in the Dollisons um, Mary Dollison was actually just recognized last year as a, uh, an individual who's who's who in America's neighborhood associations so you know the work that she has done, um, and that her husband has done, that Frank Scott has done, um, and their executive director Ken Hudson, 
um, have done collectively to engage residents in that neighborhood um, could not have happened if they were not the ones doing the work. Um, you know, Mary has a superpower in that she can um, identify what um, what you're good at. If you meet Mary, she will she will figure out you know what your skills are and she will make use of them. Um, and, and that's something that she is able to do and that's a power that she brings into the neighborhood. And every association, every person who steps up and says, I'm going to be a leader, you know, they have powers um, and they, they use them you know, to the benefit of their neighborhood association. As you work to try, I guess the argument here is that you're trying to build social capital. Mm -hmm. You're trying to um, take advantage of leaders to build that social capital in the neighborhood. What are some examples of how you interface back with faculty and staff at the university? Can you just give a, a few examples of successes or, or areas that you think are, are re replicable elsewhere? Um, I am able to, um, to work very closely with the Immersive Learning Office here at Ball State. And um, one of the things that I do in my work in the neighborhoods is, uh, you know, I sit on a lot of different committees, a lot of task forces, and identify, you know, where, where the gaps are. If, um, if the Whiteley Safety Committee, you know, needs help uh, figuring out why there are relationship issues between the police department and youth in the neighborhood, you know, I can go back to um, the sociology department at Ball State and ask a professor, can you hold focus groups? You know, could you have a class that you can fit this project, you know, within? And, um, and we've done just that. You know, we, we were able to, um, a few years back, there was a lot of tension in the Whiteley neighborhood. We were able to bring students out to hold focus groups with the police, hold focus groups with um, youth in the neighborhood, and then brought everyone together at the end and had a really amazing dialogue um, that was created because of this relationship with the immersive learning class. Um, you know, right now I am working um, a lot with the 812 Coalition, which is um, a group of residents, nonprofits, um, stakeholders in an area of Muncie that's defined by um, 8th Street, 10th Street, Perkins, and Madison. So 812 Coalition um, is working to improve the quality of life within that particular area, which encompasses about 550 homes on the southwest side of Muncie. You know, over the last four years, that initiative really began in 2014, and over the last four years, we've raised uh, almost a half a million dollars in outside funding to um, improve things like beautification, um, housing, uh, to hold um, classes, entrepreneurial classes for residents, you know, kind of like a shark tank sort of, um, sort of class. And you know, I've gone back to the university on a number of occasions and, and said, hey, you know, we, need, um, we need some planning. We need action plans for the neighborhoods. We need um, someone to come out and really look at the housing standards. Um, we have a class that, that's um, set to take place this coming spring where we're going to have um, students working with residents to develop um, kind of a, uh, a way to address substandard housing in the A12 coalition. So residents will be uh, trained so that they can um, be advocates for safe housing. So it's really dependent on the need of the neighborhood and, and then coming back to the university and matching that need with a faculty member's interest you know, in their skill set. Yeah, that's it. that's interesting because uh, you know I, we have across the Midwest these large state universities that are teeming with experience or expertise in some area, but connecting them to a particular problem. For example, a uh, you know tension between the police and a neighborhood seems to be a pretty innovative approach. Instead of just criticizing it, let's let's connect those mm -hmm. um, together. I I get the sense that much of what you do is very difficult to measure. We live in a world where performance metrics drive funding, they drive mm -hmm. uh, interest in nonprofit participation, but you've been very successful. I mean, this has been funded both by the university and by the Ball Brothers Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, it's widely uh, received, well received here in, in Muncie. Uh, how do you think about communicating or talking about the successes that you've had? And could you give a few examples? Measurement is um, hands down the most difficult part of my job. You know, there are certain things that we can measure, but 
but should we be measuring them and, and do they really mean what we want them to mean? So if we're measuring you know, how organized a neighborhood is, does that really mean that the neighborhood is impa impacting the quality of life of their neighborhood or does it just mean that they're well organized? So um, you know, I can say that there's a lot of research on how neighborhoods impact health. And um, you know, research says that individuals who are more connected, so they, they have strong relationships with their family, their friends, and their community lead healthier lives. And you know, at the present time, Muncie and Delaware County are ranked 85th out of 92 counties for um, health factors. So you know, in, in the long run, if we're doing the good work of building community, we would hope to see you know, that number go down, that we would become a healthier community because we are connecting people. We are helping to build connect connections amongst neighbors. Um, you know, another thing that we can look at um, and, and potentially measure um, and have an impact on is safety. Um, you know, there's, there's research to say that um, the two of the single uh, biggest factors in um, neighborhood safety are how many neighbors you know directly, you know their name. So if you know the names of your neighbors and the amount of activity that happens on your street, you know, people walking their dog, um, people walking to uh, the grocery store, um, people mowing, you know, people on the street, eyes on the street, and actually knowing the names of your neighbors impact safety more than anything else. So, you know, we would hope to see that through um, community work, through the development of neighborhood associations, through um, just bringing people together, that um, safety will increase, that there'll be fewer instances of crime, um, you know, those types of things. That seems like a pretty short-term, almost immediate outcome. I think that's, uh, I would applaud you for discussing that because I think it gets too often passed by in economic development discussions because that's really what you're doing. You're doing mm -hmm the type of economic development that I think research increasingly says has an effect on things that matter to employers, health and mm -hmm. insurance costs, uh, the de deployment of revenues by local government to mm -hmm. neighborhoods, uh, the quality of neighborhoods, things that attract people uh, who can then work in em employers' establishments. So mm -hmm. um, I've thought for a long time that maybe we, uh, a lot of people might scoff. There are people, there are viewers right now are scoffing at the role of this sort of community development effort. But you know, can you make a, an argument for focusing on neighborhoods, why that's important? Your, your, the cost of your enterprise is a fraction of the cost of the smallest tax incentive this county's ever given, mm -hmm. right? So from a, you know, maybe con contextualize this in a benefit cost framework, what you're trying to do, and what you think some of the ultimate goals might be for communities? Well, I can say that you know, neighborhoods are where life happens. You know, that, that is where we go home every day, that's where we raise our children. Um, and really, you know, people make a decision to live somewhere um, based off of you know, the home that they wanna live in and the neighborhood in which that home sits. So neighborhoods really are an economic driver. If we are able to, um, impact the quality of life in our neighborhoods, you know, that, that uh, impact that we're making is going to um, have a ripple effect, you know, throughout the neighborhood, throughout the city. So really, you know, resources um, should be focused toward developing safe, healthy um, neighborhoods, and that can be done by, um, you know, this type of work, by focusing on this type of work, building community. So you're working in Muncie and the facts here are tough. We're in our fifth, I work here as well, mm -hmm. we're in our fifth decade of population decline. Um, we have housing stock that is very mixed. We have some lovely homes and neighborhoods and we have other places where there are 40% of homes on a city block are vacant. Um, poverty has, has been not rising but fairly persistent and reasonably high for some time. Uh, schools have been challenged and back, been taken over by the state. You, you've talked a lot about the process for success. Can you talk about those, not, not necessarily naming communities, but mm -hmm. what are the real challenges that you have? Where are the almost insurmountable blocks uh, to trying to get into communities and, and, and develop social capital, have them take a more mm -hmm. meaningful and improving role in their, their circumstance? Well, I would say that, that in reality, you know, the biggest challenge that I have is 
individuals who, who don't respect and don't understand this work, don't understand the power that a neighborhood association or even a single resident can have. You know, I've been in meetings where people have said, um, you know, picking up tires, that's, that's the small work, that the almost inconsequential work. When in reality, if you go to those neighborhood association meetings and you're talking to residents, what they're talking about are the tires in their alleys because that's what they see every day. So, you know, what they want to do is they want to hold the cleanup and they want to pick up the 200 tires. And those small successes mean something to them. And then you can build off of that. So, you know, really it's the people that say that this work isn't, isn't important when in reality it is. And the data and the numbers um, show that, you know, neighborhoods have an impact on our health. They have an impact on our safety. Um, and, you know, we can really work to improve that um, through neighborhood association developments. That's interesting. I work, uh, my research center works very closely with the Indiana Communities Institute. And we're in communities outside of Muncie around the state and we're seeing an increasing shift of resources away from what I would call traditional business attraction, the incentives and money spent on large infrastructure for a factory or a, a large warehouse or a corporate headquarters, shifting more towards community development. There's an adjacent county here where the Chamber of Commerce funds uh, five separate child early child study centers, right? So that they, they're viewing this as a um, a, a long-term economic goal, recognizing that we've been in, it took us 50 years to get where we are, it's going to take uh, more than half that long to get out of it. Are, are you seeing changes in that mindset here in Muncie or in other places? Because I, I know that you are invited to speak uh, around the Midwest on these issues. Is, are you seeing a shift that way or is it, are we still seeing places that are resisting adjustment towards a more local or neighborhood focus? I would say there's definitely a shift. You know, over the last um, eight years, uh, we've grown the number of neighborhood associations through the Muncie Action Plan and through Building Better Neighborhoods from five to 28. So you know, people are really getting on board with this. They understand that you know, the greatest change can happen at the neighborhood level through grassroots efforts, um, that everyone can play a role in that, um, which is really exciting. So you've gone from, five, in four years, three and a half years, you've gone from five neighborhood associations to, to 28. I've seen your website. It's a very interesting map um, just to, to, to show what's happening in, in Muncie. Do you think there's beginning to be interest? You know, we have a very large student population. Are you getting more students reaching out to participate in this sort of thing? Or is that still a, a difficult final challenge for you? It's still a challenge. There are a couple of neighborhoods around the university that are primarily uh, student rental. And um, I actually am the president of one of those. And you know, we, we do spend a great deal of time um, you know, thinking within our neighborhood association, how do we attract more students to, you know, to bring them into the fold so that they can understand that they are part of a neighborhood, that we need them, they need us. Um, so there's, there's a definite interest in you know, bringing youth and bringing younger people and their energy and their ideas into the fold of neighborhood associations. And um, you know, no one has really uh, developed the um, end all way to do that. You know, we, we hold events um, that we hope that the students will come to. We make sure to invite them and include them. Um, but really one of the best ways that we've been able to interact with students um, through Muncie's neighborhoods are really immersive learning classes. So the university um, is very impactful in taking students out into the neighborhoods to do um, you know, classes or, or to do uh, projects that are mutually beneficial. So the students are learning something and the community member um, ends up with an end product hopefully that they can then utilize um, to their best interest. So we've um, had success in the past working with the um, urban planning students who will go out and do a, a neighborhood action process with neighborhood action plan process with the neighborhoods. So they're meeting one on one with residents. You know, they're getting to hear, you know, what are the, what are the issues in your neighborhood? You know, um, what are some things that, you know, you would like to change? Is it noise? Is it safety? Um, you know, we had, you know, one, one really kind of humorous meeting on the southeast side of town where the residents were really concerned about loose dogs and loose children. 
and, and you know and the students love that so they're working through through um, those issues and and then bringing back best practices from across the country that maybe the residents they don't have the time or uh, maybe the ability to um, to do that research so then the students then have a conversation with them well what of the what of these best practices what will work for you and then developing a plan that the neighborhood can then take and work off of so you know it's those one-on-one -on -one conversations that the students have with residents that I believe are truly impactful for the student and for the resident um, because it you know you're developing relationships there you're seeing that you know that the students um, you know although they may not be from Muncie you know they care you know they, they seem to really care about about the issues that we're facing here and they're um, doing their best to help us address them that's a great I give a plug for one of the immersive learning classes that I taught a few years ago that had international students no 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 kids from Muncie uh, and it it was the, they really enjoyed the participation, learned an awful lot, and not just working the community, but being a team of people with wholly different skills. I mean, finance, accounting, you know, natural resource management. So it was a, it was an interesting process, and I'm proud to see that continuing and being impactful. In a very brief, um, we got a, about a minute left. Where would you like to take this program? What's your next steps here, and are you thinking about expanding it elsewhere? In Muncie, um, ideally, what I'd, what I'd love to do is to take these neighborhood action plans that we've done with nearly um, every neighborhood of need in the city. So those are the, the ones that um, circle the downtown and take those to the next step. So how do we help the neighborhoods work through those action steps? Because when you just leave them with a plan, are, are they able, you know, with volunteers to, to really take that plan and, you know, act on it? So really, I would love to be able to bring more students, um, more employees even, to help with those action plans to, um, to see them you know, come to fruition. And then I would love to be able to, um, to expand out into the county, um, you know, into the East Central region. Um, I do speak um, with other communities about how to develop neighborhood associations in their cities. So um, there is definitely a need for this type of work, and I would love to be able to, you know, help communities, you know, across the state, even um, develop neighborhoods and develop neighborhood associations with strong leaders, so that you know change can really be um, happening across the state. I thank you. I, I believe your program is a real model for community engagement, and it's a good model for communities to 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 look to a university to provide. I appreciate hearing your perspective. I'll probably have you back here in a couple of years to see okay. what else you've done. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you. And folks, that's it for the roundtable this month. My name is Michael Hicks. I hope you've enjoyed our guest, Heather Williams. We'll see you next month.